much for coming and thank you for uh, um, inviting me and uh, inaugurating this wonderful series. Um, good for you, good for you for uh, um, trying to get perspectives from different directions regarding how uh, the artificial and uh, uh, um, um, biological neural networks learn. I, I certainly am very much interested in this topic as well. So um, I want this to be uh, something where uh, you guys uh, um, uh, not just listen, but, but um, have the opportunity to think about what I'm saying. And so I'm going to stop along the way and I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask questions because I think by asking questions, you make it so that I, I learn more about what I'm talking about and also other people um, can understand a little bit better. So I'm sure that your questions are not just yours, but also many other people are, are going to be confused along the way. So I'm going to talk about the cerebellum. And um, I'm going to uh, first tell you about the people who, who I'm really lucky to work with. So this is from a couple of days ago. We had a, um, uh, a birthday of one of my students. And let me just introduce the people in the lab. So this is Paul Hage, um, Simon Orozco, Amin Fakharian. Uh, there was the birthday of Jay Pai, uh, who was sitting in the front here. This is uh, Alden Shoup, uh, NQ Jang, and that's me. And uh, a person that I've highlighted here who just graduated um, is uh, Essan Sedaratnejad, who uh, all of these guys are PhD students, uh, except NQ, who's uh, uh, finishing his master's student. So just a small lab of uh, 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 young um, uh, scholars uh, who are working on completing their doctorate. And that's what makes our little lab. And so I'm going to describe to you the work of uh, uh, these individuals. I'm going to begin with a, a, a simple idea, which is uh, the following. Um, I, I, I think that learning from biological systems is generally fairly easy, but what's surprising is that unlearning is, is pretty hard. Um, to illustrate this, I'm going to focus on this uh, little beautiful animal, the, the honeybee. So um, the honeybee, what, uh, it, what, the, what it can do is that it can do, of course, many things, but it can learn to associate odors with nectar. So when it does this odor nectar association, what it does is that if you give it an odor, say a carnation well, it um, extends its proboscis. And so you can train it so that every time it gets this uh, uh, um, carnation well fragrance, it will extend its little, little tongue. And so here it is, here's this training of this little animal. And you see that after three sessions of training, it, it, when you give it the odor, it extends its um, little tongue. And, and this results in a long-term memory uh, in that if you come back an hour later, or two days, two days later, you still see that the, the animal has that, that ability. Now, um, typically what is done in, to cause unlearning is what's called extinction. And so what you do is you take another group of animals and train them as well, like before, but then now you present the odor, but the, you don't provide the nectar anymore. So what happens is that uh, trial after trial, the animal learns not to extend its little tongue. So um, this is called extinction training. What's really remarkable is what happens in the time that follows. So if you come back an hour later, two hours later, four hours later, and so forth, what you see is that that, that extinction didn't really erase anything. But what you see is this pattern of spontaneous recovery of memory. It's really interesting how learning produces something and then when errors change direction, when you try to unlearn, you don't necessarily cause this destructive thing, but you, you, you temporarily seem to cause suppression. But then with passage of time, there's this recovery toward the initial, initial training. So extinction training didn't really erase this previously acquired memory. This is really a fundamental thing in, in um, behavior. And it's been observed since Pavlov, how learning and unlearning take place. Um, it's not just in invertebrates that you see this. Of course, you see this in mammals. You see it in humans. So let me show you an example of uh, this idea in humans. I'm going to look at movements to produce um, adaptation and then learning from error. So suppose I ask you to look at this spot here. While you're looking here, I give you a target here. What happens is that you move your eyes from here to here. It's called a saccade. So you move your eyes like that. Now, suppose as you are doing that, I move this little target up here. So your eye ends here, but the target is here. So that's the error that you get at the end of your movement. What happens is that slowly, if you just repeat this trial after trial, the eyes become curved in their trajectory. They learn from this error. And so that their movement that used to be straight becomes this little curved movement. And if you keep on doing this, the curvature increases. Now, suppose at the end here, 
we we look at this this training. So here here's the error that I gave, and here's the I and what it did. And so initially there was no vertical component to it, and then as this error was presented, this error this caused this little vert vertical component, and we keep on doing it, and you see that there is this increase. All right. So now we reverse here. We want to cause extinction. So you you make this movement. I give you this target. You make this movement, but I jump the target downward. So now you have this error. So the error has reversed direction. Here it is. Here's this pattern of unlearning that takes place. So here's the error when it reversed direction. And here's the vertical component of the eye. The eye comes back to what it was before. And now what you do is that you present that target again, but, but you don't present any errors. It's called error clamp trial. So basically you present the stimulus precisely where the eye ends. So the target is presented, we're gonna error clamp to zero. So we're gonna presumably cause this, the circuit to stop learning and just present to me what it knows. What you see is that slowly there's a spontaneous recovery of that initial behavior. So when the errors are clamped to zero, the behavior goes back up toward where it was before. So we see this spontaneous recovery in a simple task like a saccade in, in humans. Um, it, it's really ubiquitous across many learning systems. So for example, memory of fearful events. It's true in mammals, it's true in invertebrates that you see when you associate a stimulus with an event that is fear, that causes fear, and then you take it away, cause extinction, with passage of time, it comes back. Motion adaptation shows a similar thing. Prism adaptation, you put prism goggles on the eyes and you train and then untrain, you see the spontaneous <laughs> Um, saccade adaptation shows something similar I just showed you. Contrast adaptation, perceptual stuff, shows similar. Moving of the arm, that shows something similar as well. So there's really something fundamental going on here. And um, many people have thought about this. And I'm just going to present one simple idea along this for you. And then we're going to link it to a particular um, a, a neural network, in this case, the cerebellum. And we're going to use it to try to understand, can, I, can it help us make sense of um, what this cis circuit is computing and how it's organized by this error. So um, here's a very simple model. Now, like all models, of course, this, this idea is going to turn out to be wrong. And I'm going to show it to you that it's going to be wrong. But I just want to give you the basic intuition, a couple of simple equations that describes why, in principle, learning might show this concept of uh, extinction and spontaneous recovery. So the basic idea is this. You make a prediction. And the world provides you with the actual consequences. That's your error. You're going to learn from this error. Now, um, suppose there are multiple systems that are going to learn from this error. This error is not going to just going to produce something in one place, maybe in multiple regions. And that, that makes it so that maybe some part is going to learn a lot from this error and some other part is going to learn a little from this error. So maybe that's just the nature of this, this circuit. Let's put together this in a simple set of equations. Suppose that what you're predicting is a combination of two things. Instead of many things, let's just make two things. One of them is going to learn fast. The other one is going to learn slow. Suppose that's the predictions that are being made by these two subsystems, and that's the sum total of your prediction. Now, your prediction error is the difference between what you observed and what you predicted. So here's what you predicted, here's what you observed. Now, suppose we're going to have this learning in these two systems, the fast and the slow. So the fast it's going to have this property that's going to learn a lot from the error. So this is going to be large, but it's going to forget quickly. So this is going to be small. Whereas the slow system is going to learn a little from this error. So this is going to be small, whereas this is going to be large. It's going to retain from error. So I'm going to imagine that that error is going to cause learning in two systems. One that learns a lot, but forgets quickly. The other that learns a little, but retains well. So let's, let's just simulate this system, see what happens. So we have this fast system high sensitivity to error, but has limited ability to remember. A slow system that learns a little bit from the error, but what it learns, it tends to retain. So you adapt, you're learning something. You get this typical learning curve that goes up rapidly and then goes up slowly. It has a double exponential that's so typical in learning. Okay, so as that's taking place, underneath the system are these two systems that are producing your output. There's that fast system, learns a lot from error, but it doesn't retain well. Whereas you have a slow system that learns slowly from air and retains well. So the sum of these two, sum of the fast and slow is this red. This is behavior. Now we cause extinction. So we reverse the errors here. When we reverse the errors, what happens is the behavior now comes back rapidly down to baseline. 
but these two systems don't return to baseline. The slow system slowly unlearns, the fast system rapidly unlearns. The sum of these two systems now becomes where you are. Now, what you do is that you allow time to pass, and now these two systems forget. So the fast system rapidly forgets, the slow system slowly forgets. The sum of these two is the spontaneous recovery that we see in behavior. So that's a very simple model to describe why unlearn extinction didn't cause full erasure, it just produced competition between these systems. But more interestingly, with passage of time, one system decayed slowly, the other one decayed rapidly, and you get this, this spontaneous recovery. All right, so let's go back to our saccades. Now we want to, we have the simple model that says maybe the underlying circuitry has something like this going on. Mm -hmm. All right, how do we, how do we, how do we test this idea? How do we look to see what's going on in the brain? So we think about saccades and we think, okay, what, what is responsible for learning these saccades and, and, and the behavioral data looking at patients suggests that the cerebellum has a lot to do. With it. So this is a, just to do your typical paradigm. You make a saccade, you get this error, and if you're a healthy person, what you see is that there's slowly this adaptation that takes place and that your, your saccades curve, and now you cause extinction. So you have, your saccade comes down back to normal, and then you allow time to pass, and you see the spontaneous recovery. This is what a healthy person is. You take people with cerebellar damage, and what you see is that, well, they just don't adapt very well. They, they don't learn very well from the error, and of course, if they don't learn very well, there's not much for their spontaneous recovery to take place. So the cerebellum has something to do with learning this task. But there's more to the cerebellum than just learning. I mean, the, the, it's, it's also controlling your movement. So let me show you an example. So here's, here's, a, here's a patient with cerebellar damage. I want to show you their movements, their, their saccades, so you get a sense of what the problem is. So here's their saccades. So what you're seeing is that the patient is trying to make these movements that they, they generally can make the movement, but then there's this problem at the end of the, they can't quite stabilize the eye at the target. So here's what the actual trajectories would look like. So this is the, the, um, the blue is what a healthy person would do. The red is what the patient is doing. The dotted line is the target. So the target jumps up to here. The healthy person makes a saccade, has a tiny error, then corrects for it. The patient overshoots the target, tries to correct, overshoots, overshoots, and then stabilizes, overshoots, overshoots, and finally stabilizes. So in the cerebellar patient, you, you of course, yes, you have a learning problem, but you have a control problem underneath it. So it's, it's, it's really the problem that in order to understand learning from error, we need to first understand well, what, what is the cerebellum predicting? Because without the healthy cerebellum, these movements just aren't very well produced. So I need to step back and tell you a little bit about the anatomy of the circuit, how a movement is generated and what might be the role of the cerebellum in control of that movement. Basic idea is that the cerebellum is really a side loop. There is this controller that exists in your brain that can make movements, but for whatever reasons, those movements aren't very well made. You need the cerebellum to make those movements well. Now, the structure looks something like this. So for you to move your eyes, to make a saccade, what you rely on are direct projections from your retina to a region in the midbrain called the superior colliculus. Superior colliculus can make saccades. In fact, in animals like frogs, that's all they have in order to move their gaze, move their orient their body toward the stimulus. So the way it works is that you can think about the superior colliculus as like an optimal controller that's provided with information from the gold, here's where the stimulus is, and through interaction with other brainstem pathways, the burst generators and motor neurons, it is certainly capable of making the eye move. However, in you and me, in mammals in general, and many other animals, it's not trusted with that action. What happens is that that visual information also, of course, goes to your cortex. And the cortex evaluates what is on the screen. What, am I, what are my options? It provides you with a utility map that describes where is it that I want to go. And then through its removal of inhibition of the superior colliculus and production of excitation, the mesoganglia, the parietal cortex, the frontal eye field decide where to go and get the colliculus to actually produce that movement. Now, a copy of the commands 
that the colliculus is presenting goes to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum does some magic with this, with the commands that are being computed and makes some kind of prediction that appears to be central in uh, organizing the, the output to make it correct, to make it well, well made. So um, this circuit has been studied in, in the past 50 years by real giants of neuroscience. So the colliculus and the brainstem pathway has been studied by David Robinson, Bob Wurtz, David Sparks, who've really mapped out how the circuitry is generating the saccade. Then in the cortex, we have giants as well, Kahiti Hikosaka, Paul Glimsher, Mickey Goldberg, Richard Anderson, who have described the evaluation of the stimulus by the cortex and the basal ganglia, deciding where I should move my eyes. And in the cerebellum, we have giants as well that have thought about how the cerebellum is getting this sensory, this motor output of the uh, colliculus and, and then potentially producing these corrections. So you might ask, okay, Reza, where the heck do you fit in? Well, why are you telling us something new about the cerebellum when there were these people who have obviously studied the circuits for decades? What, what's, what's the problem that, you, that ex still exists? Well, here's the basic problem. When we measure neural activity in the cerebellum during saccades, in fact, we have a really hard time understanding its language. What is it that is predicting? And I will show you, it's not a simple problem. E even after these 50 years, we still don't really know how to go from the spikes that the cerebellum is generating to understanding what is it that it's predicting with its output. And so I started with the problem of learning, but really the foundation of this problem, we can't really understand learning from error until we understand what is being predicted, which is the basis of describing what is the prediction error. Okay, so fortunately, the cerebellum is a three-layer network. So in a sense, it's not that difficult to think about what is it's being computing. So the cerebellum looks something like this. It gets input, copy of those commands via mossy fibers. It's called efferent copy. That goes to its first layer called granule cells, then the hidden layer, Purkinje cells, and then the output layer, the nucleus cells. And that's presumably the output that makes predictions. Those predictions are sent via inhibition to a region of the brainstem called inferior olive that gets the combination of observation and that inhibition. And the difference between those two is a prediction error that is gets sent back to the cerebellum. In particular, the prediction error is sent back with incredible accuracy, with very high strength to the Purkinje cell. So that every time there is a, there's a spike in the inferior olive neuron, there will be a spike in the Purkinje cell, but it will be a very special spike called complex spike. Let me show it to you. So we're gonna show you activity from Purkinje cells. And I wanna show you the two kinds of spikes that are generated here. So the Purkinje cells are gonna make your normal spikes, the sender prediction down here. These are called these simple spikes here. And then they're gonna be these errors that are gonna be sent back to the, to the Purkinje cells. And we're gonna be able to differentiate these two kinds of spikes. And here's, here's what it looks like. So the neuron is making its predictions. The Purkinje cell is sending its output. These are the simple spikes here. These are the things presumably that affect your behavior. And the error information that is coming back is also dissociable. Here are these complex spikes. So, all right, this is really great because we can, we can actually see in a single neuron its output that is producing and the error that is being sent back to it. So the prediction errors are conveyed via these complex spikes. But our job is to understand those simple spikes because those simple spikes are what's producing the modification of your behavior and presumably affecting, affecting your, your movements. All right, so what's the problem? The problem is as follows. The activity of those Purkinje cells, those simple spikes that are being produced are really difficult to interpret. So here's our, our subject. This is a, this is a marmoset. And uh, we study marmosets because they allow us to do something really fundamental they allow us to, to look at the cerebellum using these modern probes that were developed for rodents. So marmosets are small. They're small primates, highly social, that move their eyes just like you and me. Um, but because they're small, we can use these modern probes to record simultaneously from many neurons. As I would show you, that's gonna be the key, one of the keys in understanding this neural computation, which is gonna be how spikes among neurons aligns themselves in time and the prediction is both in terms of the firing rates and in terms of 
the timing of the spikes. All right, so here's our marmoset making saccades. So here's the eye. The eye is moving, um, in this case, to the left or to the right. This is the velocity of the eye. And here's the activity of one Purkinje cell. So it's the simple spikes that are being produced. So in this case, this Purkinje cell has a baseline activity of about 40 hertz. It pauses, and then it goes back up again. So one of the things you notice is that in the patient that I was showing you, they had trouble stopping the eye. So you would think that the cerebellum would have a lot to do with precise prediction of when to stop the eye, when to produce the activity that you need to, to stop the eye. But if you look at the activity, at least this one cell that I'm showing you, you see that it pauses before the saccade starts and it keeps on pausing long after the saccade is over. Now, some pause. Here's, some, here's another cell, a third cell. There's a fourth cell who doesn't pause. It seems to burst, but it bursts after the movement is over. This one bursts and pauses. This one just bursts, and this one does something else. So this is the typical problem in neurophysiology. You have behavior, and you look at the activity of individual neurons, and they're all over the place. What's really puzzling is that the activity seems to last much longer to move than the movement, even though we saw that when there was damage to cerebellum, the problem came, was, was coming up at the end of the movement, which we would have thought the cerebellum is doing something to predict this end of the movement, but we certainly don't see it in the simple spikes of the individual cells. All right, so that's our problem. How do we understand this encoding? All right, so here's the basic idea. That's, this, this idea is really about a planner. You can think about like an urban planner. The urban planner is the error. The error is gonna go and organize the cells so that there will be some groups of cells that prefer error, say, to the left. And there will be another group of cells that prefers errors, say, upward. The third group of cells that would prefer errors to the right. And here's what we're thinking about the anatomy of the system, that the Purkinje cells form groups. And the membership of that group is defined by the error that they receive. So there will be a group of Purkinje cells. We know anatomically there are about 50 of them that project onto a single nucleus neuron. But we think that the, the, what makes this membership is that you have to receive the same error from the inferior olive. And so that, that, that Purkinje cells that belong to what we call a population, they have something in common. They all care about the same error. And I'm gonna to describe to you what that means. So, all right, what is this error that you're talking about, Rasi? What, what, how does it come about? So let's go back to our basic idea about the input to the structure. So suppose you are looking at a target on the screen, like this cartoon shows, and I show you a target here. So if, if you're looking at this target on the screen, there's activity in part of your colliculus called the rostral pole. So there's a bunch of neurons here that are active while you're holding your eyes still. I show you a target here. That produces activity in another part of the visual system, and this is going to produce activity in this part of the colliculus to the to, to down here. So suppose now I you, you decide to make a saccade. This activity rises, the one falls, and moves your eyes to this location. So you're looking over here now. Now what your brain would predict is that if your target is on the fovea, there should be activity here at the this part of the superior colliculus. But I've jumped the target over here, so the activity is over here. So this is the expected sensory consequence. You moved your eye, the target should be on the fovea, but actually it's over here. So there's a different group of neurons than expected for them to be active. So error produces unexpected activity among neurons in a specific region of the superior collectors because the visual map is mapped on to the space. You expected it to be here, but it's actually here. So there are different groups of neurons active than what you expected. That's the actual sensory consequence. It activates the inferior olive, now this error is going to some group of Purkinje cells. So suppose there are some groups of Purkinje cells that care about this error, whereas another group of Purkinje cells that care about some other error. Suppose that's the anatomy by which this, this structure is organized. So then the question is, how do we then look at this, this population? The first step is not to measure the simple spikes, but to measure the error, which is the complex spike. So measure how each, P, each Purkinje cell responds to an error. This is our subject. They ask to fixate. A target is shown. They make a saccade. We jump the target to some random direction and record those complex spikes. So suppose we jump the target to the left. These red things that you see here 
are the complex spikes. So in this case, what you see is that um, there are some complex spikes that are generated when the air is to the left. When the air is to the right, there are fewer complex spikes that are generated. So you compute the number of complex spikes that you get for this kind of an error versus this kind of an error. And what you see is a tuning. So this P cell cares about leftward errors. Why is it? Because it's getting input from a specific part of the superior colliculus. It, it cares about things that were unexpected in that part of the space. All right. So you can plot it as a function of time and you see that you know cells that have preference to a particular direction, we call that CSR the direction of error that produces a complex spike versus when it's in the opposite direction, we call the CS plus 180. So now you begin to see, we're gonna define cells based on their preference for error. So we're gonna define a new coordinate system and that's gonna be error space. And we're gonna ask which part of the error space do you care about? And that's gonna be the membership of your neuron. And then we're gonna to put together the cells that care about the same error. And then we're gonna ask if we do that, does the simple spikes, the simple spikes that produce, do they make sense now if we define the space this way? So here's the basic idea. Use the preference for error to define this new coordinate system. All right, so suppose we record for a bunch of Purkinje's. So in this case, it's the right part of the cerebellar purpose. And this is the distribution of the error that they care about. Some care about upward error, leftward error, downward error, mostly contralateral side they care about in this case, this part of the cerebellum. Now what you do is the following. For each Purkinje cell, use its CS on vector, the vector of error that it prefers to define this new coordinate system that you're talking about. So suppose for a particular neuron, it prefers these errors over to the, at, 200, at, at, at 135 degrees. So suppose this is the error that it prefers. Now you make a saccade like this, that's 45. You would say this is a 45 degree saccade. But instead of calling it a 45 degree saccade, let's rotate our coordinate system and put zero based on preference for error. This saccade now becomes CS plus 250. So all we did is define a coordinate system based on error and now define movements with respect to the preferred error of that circle. All right, so when you do that, something I think really just remarkable happens. So this is our saccade. Animal made this saccade and some cells burst, some cells pause, some cells do much more complicated things. In all cases, their activity lasts much longer than the norm. Now, what we can do is we can just arbitrarily say some of these pausers and some of these bursters and just look at those, those cells activities. And what you would see is that, well, you know, these bursters are obviously increasing their activity, these pausers are decreasing their activity. But now instead of talking about movements in the direction of Cartesian coordinates, let's talk about it in terms of direction of error. So in this case, the movement is in direction CS plus 180. What you see is that if you now simply sum the activities of neurons that all cared about that same error, you see something remarkable. You see there's a burst of activity in their simple spikes followed by a pause, and then the modulation goes away. So individual cells didn't show anything like this. They showed bursting, pausing, and all over the place. But if you organize the cells based on the error that they preferred, and look at the population activity among those neurons, now you see something that's sensible and it becomes direction dependent. So in a particular direction, in direction CS plus 180, you see this burst pause and you, know, you see something a little bit less modulated in other directions. So organizing the cells based on preference for error gave us something interesting in terms of their, their spiking. And you see something Further, now, if the velocity of the movement becomes higher, 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 what you see is that the activity in this burst increases, but then this pause that I showed you seems to be time locked to the when the movement is supposed to stop, the deceleration. So the burst grows with the velocity, but then the pause seems to be time locked to the onset of deceleration, which suggests that organizing the P cells in this way is predicting when the movement should be stopped. So this is a burst followed by a pause. These are inhibitory neurons. Purkinje cells are inhibitory neurons. So they are inhib they're increasing their inhibition. Then they're releasing their inhibition right around the time when you're supposed to stop the movement. So let me briefly summarize what I showed you so far. We had a hard time understanding activity of individual cells. We wanted to know how do we organize them into populations. What we did in the cerebellum is that we organized the cells into groups based on preference for error. 
when we did this, the simple spikes, the things that they were being predicted, predicted some features of the ongoing saccade, particularly timing of the deceleration onset. So let me stop for a second here, see if you have any questions. Hi, sorry, I have a quick question. Of course. Yeah, so so presumably these complex spikes are actually, you know, changing some, something about the plasticity of the Purkinje cells from the granule cells, right? Yeah, so, yeah. So, they re so the representation of the, of the Purkinje cells is going to shift in, in some direction. That, that's okay. that the, the teaching signal is telling them. So if you pick, let's say we pick out all the Purkinje cells that have complex spikes in you know similar similar complex spikes are they gonna starting from start from a different position and then you know those Purkinje cells are gonna shift in the same direction basically as they they're both getting the same teaching signal and change their plasticity in the same direction yeah exactly I'm gonna show you that so you know I started with the learning problem but then I said I can't attack the learning problem until I understand the control problem and so we've made some progress on the control but then we're going to switch to learning in the later part of my lecture. So far, all I've said is that I think the organization is based on error. We'll see how that error causes plasticity. Great, thanks. I guess my question was pretty much it. <laughs> no, a great question. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, don't be shy. Please stop me if, if, if things don't make sense. Okay, so um, so far what I've shown you is that, um, that the mo there's modulation of these Purkinje cells firing based on the movement that was taking place. And there was a, which is basically describing how average firing rates change. And you know, we started with this idea that there's this group of Purkinje cells that project onto the nucleus and what they share is this error signal. Now, they're inhibitory neurons. So these, these neurons are inhibiting this nucleus cell. So through their activity, they're going to manipulate how the nucleus cell is going to fire. And, and one way they're going to manipulate that activity is through the firing rates. I just showed you that when the saccade takes place in a group of Purkinje cells, the activity is a burst. So there's inhibition, then there's disinhibition, removing that inhibition. So, so this is one way by which you can get the nucleus cell to fire by removing your inhibition. But there's something even more interesting, which has to do with spike timing. So if these neurons that are projecting here um, increase their activity, but then decrease their activity, but then maybe during this period when they were um, removing their inhibition, maybe the few spikes that remain, if they would align it in time so that there was synchrony among that group of Purkinje cells, maybe you would get even better control of when this nucleus cell would fire. So let me show you that in the cerebellum, firing rates are important but spike timing is critical in controlling the nucleus neuron. So this is a work from Happy Gale, Person, and Indira Raman in, uh, in slice and anesthetized animals. And, and here's, what, here's what they found. That they found that if you take a group of Purkinje cells that project onto a nucleus neuron, so these are all inhibitory neurons that are projecting here, and then you manipulate the average firing rate, but then control the timing of when these these neurons or these Purkinje cells are going to spike. And look at what the nucleus cell will do. So if you have eight Purkinje cells, each are firing at 50 hertz average firing rate, but the spikes are not synchronized, then the nucleus neuron, which is what's shown here, it just, it's just going to be suppressed because it's just getting all this inhibition from the Purkinje cells. But if you take those same eight Purkinje cells and you control them to fire at 50 hertz as before, but now make the spikes so that they're 50% synchronous, now there's something interesting happens. When a synchronous spike arrives, it's likely that right afterwards, a nucleus cell is gonna produce a spike. So by synchronizing their activity, you could get the nucleus cell to fire when you want it to fire. That's very interesting. Do we see an example of this in behavior? Do Purkinje cells synchronize their spikes? So um, I mentioned to you that one of the advantages of working with marmosets is that they're small. And because they're small, we can use these wonderful new probes to record simultaneously from multiple Purkinje cells, something that until recently in primates was not possible. What do we see? We see something remarkable. We see that at the time when there was a suppression of simple spikes, that suppression 
produced an increase in the probability of synchronous spiking. So this is called the synchronization index. So a, a, a measure of synchrony corrected for chance that gives you a sense of how coordinated are, is the timing of the simple spikes that, that are being produced. This is a one millisecond time bin looking at the probability of synchrony. And what we found was that in certain directions, in direction CS plus 180, high degree of synchrony, and then this synchronization falls as you move to different directions of the saccade. So it appears that within groups that prefer a specific error, P cells combine their firing rates with synchrony to predict when the movement should be stopped. So you remove the inhibition, you disinhibit, but the few spikes that remain become synchronized. Now, all right, so we're getting a sense of understanding how this prediction is being made. You're predicting something about when to stop the movement. Does this help us understand this original problem? I started with, with, with the question of unlearning, right? Why is unlearning difficult? Now, let me go back now to put the, put the story together for you, present for you a model of this anatomy of the circuit based on error. So you make a movement, you experience an error. That error says to the right. In your cerebellum, there will be some cells that prefer that error. They're gonna learn a lot from that error. And these are the errors that are gonna cause learning, particularly in that group of cells. That same error is gonna produce this suppression of activity of these Purkinje cells. So it's gonna produce adaptation. That adaptation is gonna be a suppression of their activity. So early in adaptation, their activity is gonna be high. With training, if you keep giving me these errors, their, their activity falls, it suppresses their activity. That error that you experience to the right is also gonna be causing adaptation in another group of neurons. These neurons prefer leftward errors, but they're still gonna get this rightward error. And so they're gonna see suppression of their complex spikes. The suppression of the complex spikes below baseline also produces learning. Now in this group, it causes an increase in their activity. So a single error is evaluated by multiple Purkinje cells. Some prefer that error. For some, it is the anti-error. It is in the opposite direction. For the ones that prefer the error, that error causes an increase in the probability of complex spikes. For the ones that they don't prefer that error, that causes suppression in the complex spikes. Both learn from the change in the complex spikes. In the ones that prefer the error, the increase that the produces reduction in activity suppresses the, the, the synapses. The ones that, for them, the complex spikes cause the suppression, that suppression causes an increase in their activity. Now, what's interesting is that for the ones that had the error, that had a preference for error in the 180 direction opposite, there's this slow process of adaptation. The ones that prefer that error, there's this rapid process of adaptation. So there's fast learning in Purkinje cells for which the error was in the preferred direction, there's slow learning in Purkinje cells for which the error was in direction CS plus 180. So this provides us with the window. It's just conjecture of why unlearning is difficult. So this is the basic thing that we saw before. We have learning, extinction, and then the spontaneous recurrence. So what's going on? In the cerebellum, Neurons may be organized based on this concept of preference for error. So you have some neurons that prefer error in this part of the space and others that prefer error in another part of the space. Each group specializes in a specific, in this case, error direction. I haven't talked about magnitude. I don't know much about that, in fact. So if you experience an error, that produces changes in many P cells. Some prefer that error. For others, they don't prefer that error. Those that prefer the error, we think, learn rapidly from that error. Reversal of the error, when we do extinction training, engages a new group of Purkinje cells that prefer that error. So by, by changing the error direction, you bring to bear groups of neurons that now prefer that error rather than the one that came before. The differing rates of learning and decay in the various Purkinje cells may underlie this concept of spontaneous recovery. So, um, what's, what's wrong with the data and the ideas that I've been showing? What are some of the limitations of these ideas? The idea that complex spikes transmit error is by itself a debatable concept. So in, in the field of cerebellar learning, some may not agree that the error is really transmitted by 
complex spikes. Some think that complex spikes potentially reflect other aspects of behavior. So we need better experiments that associate sensory prediction errors from movements that follow. Um, the other big hole in what I was showing you is that I, I just keep focusing on the Purkinje cells, but you know, that's not the output of the cerebellum, right? Purkinje cells are the middle layer. And what's, what's nice about the middle layer is that they, you can dissociate the error signal from its predictions, but really the output of the cerebellum is of course from its nucleus. And I told you nothing about what the output of the cerebellum is. So, oh my God, we have a long ways to go before we can really understand the, the, the principles of this prediction error and how learning takes place. And finally, um, what I showed you is that the Purkinje cells are potentially making predictions, not just by changing their firing rates, but also by synchronizing their spikes. So what this suggests is that there's probably a learning rule waiting to be discovered in the cerebellum. And that learning rule has, has to do with not just producing change in the synaptic weights so that you change the firing rates, but you change the synaptic weights so that the network better aligns the spikes that are being produced by those Purkinje cells. So a learning rule that changes synchrony as a function of error. That learning rule remains to be discovered. It means to be tested, really. But I suspect that error isn't just changing the firing rates. Error is also changing the timing of when the cells within that population are likely to produce spikes together. OK, so let me summarize. I showed you that it's hard to unlearn. Many kinds of adaptation and learning in animals from invertebrates to humans exhibit concept of spontaneous recovery. Theory suggests that this phenomenon may be due to a fast and a slow learning mechanism. So just some simple equations. What we did is that we built a marmoset lab and used some of the modern probes that are available to record from the cerebellum of these animals in order to understand the predictions that are being made and how error changes their activity of these, these cells. The problem that we faced is that in order for us to understand the language of the cerebellum, what we had to do was to put together a basically a new coordinate system with which we can organize the Purkinje cells. And what we did is that we said Purkinje cells, we think, are organized based on this preference for error. And when we did that, what we saw was that the simple spikes, the things that were being predicted, really nicely encoded movement kinematics. They made predictions about when to decelerate and when to stop the movement. So that made sense from the perspective of why people with cerebral deficits have these stopping issues. What we saw was that when an error occurred, one population of neurons learned slowly, they, they, the error was in their anti-preferred direction, while another learned rapidly. And we think that maybe the timing and the decay properties of these two circuits might underlie the spontaneous recovery. So the implication is, that neural networks like the cerebellum may be organized based on a preference for error. So unlike in machine learning, you know, in backpropagation, what you do is that you take the error and you set it to everybody and everybody's gonna learn based on how much they contributed to making that error. In this case, we think is that the anatomy of the circuit limits exposure of groups of neurons to specific kinds of errors. And maybe that, that makes it so that now you can't really unlearn well because the groups of neurons are gonna be involved in learning the opposite error are not gonna be the same as the ones that learn the original error. So potentially that might help us understand why unlearning is difficult. Um, let me end with a lovely idea by Leonard Cohen. He says, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. All right. I'm open to your questions and look forward to learn from you. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Fraser. That was a really, really great talk and covered a lot of ground with everything from marmosets, human patients, and uh, some really nice network models. Um, yeah, I think there's probably some questions in the audience. So if people want to put questions in the chat, I can read them out or feel free to turn your camera on and uh, come on screen as well. Who 
wish there was a way for me to see you. That would be even better. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think in this screen mode, for some reason, I can only see myself. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. So please, let me know what you think. Um, well, I guess maybe I'll take the first question while people have a think. Um, so you sort of alluded to this idea about how the magnitude might affect the circuit yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you want to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, um, it's really puzzling um, to, to see that obviously the visual space is so well tiled with uh, things that tell us position, which is, you know, a, a vector space with respect to the phobia. Um, but the complex spikes are really low dimensional representation of that vector space. They definitely tell us direction, um, but the amplitude, it, it's hard to see. Um, maybe it has to do with the timing of the complex spike. We have some speculation about when the complex spike occurs. So uh, if it occurs at a, at a sweet spot, it causes a lot of learning. If it, if it occurs later or earlier, it produces less learning. And maybe the magnitude of the error has something to do with that timing. We found some evidence for it, um, but it's, it's, it's early days. Thanks. Hey, um, I had maybe a question when at the end you talked about, uh, in this implication panel, you talked about this produces masking, but not unlearning. Uh, could you maybe touch a little bit more on what differences that would imply? Because, for example, masking some neurons, it's something I'm actually working on in artificial neural networks. And I was wondering if this masking uh, actually enables you to maybe compose in different ways than unlearning uh, would yeah. not. Uh, yeah. So imagine, and that maybe could be a, a good, maybe a good thing. I don't know. Imagine, imagine a circuit where you have groups of neurons that care about leftward errors and groups of neurons that care about rightward errors. Well, when you have leftward errors, this group of neurons is gonna learn, but when you're trying to unlearn, your prediction error reverses direction. So now you're gonna get this group of neurons that are gonna learn. And the two are gonna obviously compete with each other. And so for your ability to come back to baseline, to unlearn, it's really because this and these two circuits have now competing with each other. And this is masking this group because it's, it's effectively learned to undo what this other component of the circuit has learned. Um, and if these two circuits had decay properties in what they have learned that would then exp express itself with passage of time, that might help us understand why there is these concepts of spontaneous recovery. Thanks. Hey. Can you hear me? Sorry. A little yeah. louder, please. Yeah. Okay. Very, very nice talk. Very interesting. I just have a question more on the concept side that for the very beginning where you start, where you expert, yeah, you talk about this model of the fast versus slow systems that could explain indeed recovery. I was just wondering because in order to get back to exactly, in order to get back to the to the baseline, when you combine these two systems, you need that the fast system actually doesn't go back to baseline. Yeah. But it, so the, what is the implication here? This would mean that the, the, the fast component of learning, when it receives a error that is in the opposite direction of the previous one, it actually doesn't learn to forget, but it learns the opposite of what it was learning. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Which are so, the implications here to, to, to have the overall adaptation go back to baseline? Right, right. So, the, of course, just to be very clear to you, this model is wrong in the sense that, the, you know, I, I, I haven't put into these equations the concept of preference for error. The equations here only have the concept of learning fast and learning slow. So, um, what you're seeing is that you you have a you have a you have basically the ability to just learn a lot from the error. So you have a big error here. The system is going to learn a lot from it and it's going to compensate the same way it's going to learn a lot from the errors at the beginning. Um, this slow system that that large error is only can learn a little bit from it. So what you end up with is this 
the circuitry that is competing with the circuitry, which is the basic idea that I wanted to, to convey, that reversal of error does not bring the two systems back to the original state, but that it causes competition between these two systems. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I actually had another question, which I was wondering about, um, but it was a bit more from the paper, maybe. So in the paper, you mentioned that um, you mentioned that it's known that some of the connections are quite weak. I think from yes. the output to the P cells, yes, yes, the connections yes. are quite weak. So it kind of got me thinking that I guess people have done some connectomics on the circuits. And I guess I was just wondering, do people know how much the weights change in the circuit? Or is right. it... Right, so let me let me summarize your questions for other people to, to sure. get a sense of this. So there's there's really something puzzling in the cerebellum. And that is that um, this error information, it goes really strongly to the middle layer, but not to the output layer. And that's kind of weird, right? I mean, why would you why would you not want to teach the nucleus neurons as well as the middle layer neurons? But that's that is indeed the case. Um, and uh, I don't know the rationale for it, only to say that, so, so your question is, is there learning in the nucleus neurons? There, there is, um, uh, we, we know much less about it, that, but partly because we can't measure the error signal in the nucleus cells. It's, 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 this path is so weak that it just becomes another spike and you can't tell the difference between the inputs, various inputs that are coming to this nucleus cell, however, in experiments that look at learning, have, they have noticed that there is indeed plasticity that's taking place in the nucleus cells, perhaps much slower than the uh, plasticity that's taking place in Purkinje cells. And um, the, the ideas that I was trying to say in that paper is that if you have this strong error signal here, well then you, you're facing a problem of how to teach the nucleus cells and maybe by organizing the Purkinje cells into clusters, into these populations that all receive the same error, then maybe through synchrony among those cells, you could teach the nucleus cell that should also have been learning from that error. And maybe that's one way by which the circuit solves this problem of not getting error to the output layer. And then maybe a, a slightly related question is, uh, so the complex spikes, you know, let, supposing that they're involved in, in plasticity and so they're causing some of the synapses to get stronger. Do you think yeah. the complex spikes are actively also driving potential, like depotentiation or, you know, long-term long depression? Or do you think it's simply a matter of strengthening certain synapses and then allowing the other ones to just have like a weight decay, you know, slowly decaying over time? And so the complex... So this is the complex spikes. Uh, uh, David Marr in 1968 uh, proposed that idea that basically the complex spikes are the response are, are responsible for inducing plasticity in the synapses from the granule cells onto the um, onto the Purkinje cells, and that has definitely been shown to be the case that complex spikes cause LTD in the Purkinje cells and lack of complex spikes produces LTP in the projections of the parallel fibrous granule cells onto the Purkinje cells. Okay, well, uh, if there's no more questions, um, I hope everyone would just join me in thanking Razor for what was a really interesting talk, which crossed a lot of our interests. Um, it's always hard to clap on Zoom, but everyone could do the clapping emoji if they like. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you so um, much for having me. Uh, it was no, really a pleasure okay. to be here. And, and listen, you guys, if there's any questions that I can help you with, uh, hey, you know, email me. I'll be happy to learn from you and you, what you're working on. Yeah, thank you so much, Rosa. Thanks guess. a lot. And Thanks so much. Bye, guys. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. And yeah, we have our next uh, speakers uh, already lined up for next month, and I'll share the details of that on uh, all the different platforms as well. Yeah, please so. let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll come along. <laughs> sure. Bye bye. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone.